Welcome, everyone, to the PFF Fantasy Podcast. I'm your host, John Macri, fantasy analyst here at PFF, and I am once again joined by the great Kate Majuk as we keep the off-season content rolling. Kate, the 2023-2024 Lions Super Bowl dream is sadly over. America and the world are devastated, but we soldier on. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm good, but, man, we we got a, like surprisingly, I think, closer to a Lions Super Bowl than anybody would have actually so expected. Close. Just given the matchup, but of course the 49ers had to pull the rug out from underneath uh, Lions Nation and ruin the hopes and dreams of everybody. But that's okay, because we're going to be talking about uh, a lion today, because yes. we're going to be talking about tight ends, and you can't spell tight end without Sam Laporta, right? So uh, that's all right. <laughs> the The Lions might be out of the postseason, but they'll never be out of our fantasy football podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely have to focus on him today because, yeah, like you said, we're, we're talking our favorite, you know, most pleasant surprises and, and biggest disappointments at uh, at the tight end position. And spoiler, Sam Laporta was not a disappointment. So um, we'll be talking glowingly about him um, and then we'll wrap up our, our playoff picks as well with our, our choice for who is going to win the superb owl. Um, Kate cannot lose the picks, but we can tie. Um, I'm one game back and I know everyone loves a tie. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that in just a bit. But of course, yeah, like you said, our main focus is going to be on the tight ends of the 2023 NFL season, who's surprised us who let us down uh we got a nice list to work through here and uh, i'm looking forward to get getting into it uh, but first i want to let you all know to check out the pff mock draft simulator if you haven't already uh it's where you can take control and draft for your favorite team or do what i like to do draft for the entire league uh whatever you want uh, i know i like to draft all teams kind of make my own mocks try out different strategies for each team along the way uh it's not only a great way to kill time before the actual nfl draft which still feels so far away somehow but it's just a ton of fun if you love the draft and football uh like so many of us do so you can also use the promo code 30 mds right now on pff.com to get 30 percent off an annual subscription uh, which includes all of our nfl draft content which there will be a ton of and also of course access to the best mock draft simulator in the league here at pff so check it out now go have yourself some fun again that is promo code 30 mds for 30 percent off an annual subscription here at pff um but yeah kate let's get into our tight ends here we alluded to it obviously earlier it's no surprise that he's going to be on the list but it was a surprise at the beginning of the year sam laporta leads the group here for our pleasant surprises of the 2023 season at the tight end position uh what i mean we know what got him on the list but let's start <laughs> off with your thoughts on sam laporta's rookie year he had literally the best fantasy season by a rookie tight end ever that that got him on the list my man like yeah i think all of us looked at what kyle pitts did the generational kyle pitts and you know you saw his a yeah, thousand receiving yard season as a rookie and we knew sam laporta was a great receiving tight end but nobody expected him to score the most fantasy points by a rookie tight end ever 860 yeah. receiving yards nine touchdowns in the fantasy season i mean it, yeah, like Sam Laporta <laughs> is hashtag good. And you know what? OC Ben Johnson, hashtag good. And he's there to stay. So Sam Laporta, welcome to the elite tight end club. You got there rather quickly, my man. Really fast. Yeah, like th this was uh, obviously an amazing year from a, a rookie, especially at the tight end position, right, where the you know, the narrative a lot of the time is fade rookie tight ends because it takes them longer to develop and turn into anything in the NFL, at least for fantasy purposes. And he hit the ground running, delivered a amazing rookie season and won our rookie of the year performance when we did our award show um, as well. Uh, very deserving again, just coming out as a rookie at the tight end position and dominating the way he did appeared in all 16 games during the fantasy season. Um, Travis Kelsey, TJ Hawkinson, both those guys missed one game, which did help give Laporta the edge, but that should not diminish what he was able to accomplish in year one, especially again at a position that historically is not delivered for, for rookie fantasy production. So 
Absolutely. Um, Sam Laporta deserving of being on the top of our list here. Uh, it, and yeah, like you said, previously surpassed great rookie tight end performances of the last decade as well, uh, including Kyle Pitts in 2021, Evan Ingram in 2017. Um, yeah, instantly establishing himself kind of as that elite fantasy option at the position going forward. Um, he set the bar high in year, in, in year one, so hopefully he can continue to keep that going uh, in future seasons as well. Um one player who did also set the bar pretty high in, in year one for himself um, was Kyle Pitts. And he makes our disappointing uh, players of the 2023 season list drafted as the tight end six on the year finishes as the tight end 14. So outside of that tight end one territory, which he certainly has the talent to finish within, but um, yeah, far from it, uh, unfortunately this season. And I don't know if this was a surprise to a lot of people because I think a lot of people, you know, in 2022 kind of were down on Kyle Pitts after a, a down year then as well. And some of that was due to injury, but I think we still expected more from Kyle Pitts in 2023, just 8.3 PPR points per game, uh, which ranked 18th at the position. And he was just so inefficient that despite not missing a game, he still couldn't crack the top 12 overall tight ends on the year. So we know Arthur Smith's Falcons were a frustrating group, obviously, to sort out. Um, now, um, Arthur Smith's Steelers uh, coming up, Kate. I, I'm sure you're, you're excited <laughs> about that. Um, but th this was just incredibly frustrating. We saw his his, his playing time decrease as well um, to 65% of Atlanta's offensive snaps this year. Uh, it's just a, a bad year. He was unstartable for a lot of this season hopefully things will change kind of going forward because again we know the talent is there we were hoping for more tight end one upside and we just did not get it here in 2023 he had just a single finish inside the top five had one finish uh in, in that top five as the tight end three on the week and that was in week six so i don't know if you know how long it took sam laporta to get his first top five finish uh it it was week three. So Sam <laughs> Laporta, the rookie, delivered a top five performance sooner than our beloved Kyle Pitts. And that was as the overall tight end one in week three. So you look at these comparisons and boy, Kyle Pitts, my man, just five total finishes as a top 12 tight end in full PPR formats. That is truly something. Jonu Smith finished in the top five three different times this season to Kyle Pitts's one as the yeah. backup tight end for the Atlanta Falcons. Now I am going to say, I do think that obviously Arthur Smith and in that situation there in Atlanta, not, not favorable for consistency, right? Like this was still a run heavy team, but you look at Kyle Pitts's injury. And I do think that health, still was playing a part. I He's had that nagging knee injury. And I still have to wonder, it, like, how healthy was he this season? I don't think, I, I don't think the answer was fully. Um, and I think that that definitely played a role in maybe some of that efficiency too. I, I think so as well, right? And, and you look at, you know, at, at least his first three years in the in the league, we've seen his actual efficiency marks kind of drop off a little bit, and especially this season, right? So, you know, receiving grade dropped to a 73.0, which is still fine. It, it's 10th at the position, but it was previously 8th and then 6th at the position before that. So everything kind of fell off for Kyle Pitts this year. And, and you're right, maybe it is coming off of that injury as well, right? Because his target rate... Obviously, we know that drop down. It was 26.5% in 2020, 20, 2022 before he got hurt, which led all tight ends, but then dropped to 18.9% this year. Um, yards per route run was amazing as a rookie, 2.02, which was fifth at the position. Went to sixth at the position last year at 1.69, and then 13th at the position this year at 1.45. Um, and, and, you know, playing time and, and, and being healthy definitely seems like it's going to play a part in that. And hopefully we get a bounce back year here. Um, in, in year four for Kyle Pitts under a new coaching staff and, and offensive coordinator. So we'll see how things go. There's at least hope. I, I know people have been burned too many times by, by Kyle Pitts, but um, it could be a different offense here in, in uh, 2024. So we'll see what uh, the future holds, but not ready to fully give up on him just yet. Definitely not ready to give up on him. He's a, he's a young bird. He's still yeah. 23 years old. He turned 23 years old, like, 
two months ago, I think he's going to be just fine. Um, still, again, kind of incredible that he's going to be going into his fourth season at the, the age of 24. So like take that with the grain of salt that it is like still a very young tight end who's dealt with not the greatest of circumstances, not the greatest of quarterback play and not the greatest of health, but hopefully all of those things will be turning up and we'll see a bounce back in that efficiency, uh, you know, yards per reception, yards after the catch per reception, like all of those efficiency metrics that we saw drop. My hope is that we're going to see a, a big time bounce back in 2024 and even better. I have to imagine that after being burned this many times in, you know, the, the, your redraft leagues, he's going to fall. I think he's going to fall big time, probably this upcoming year. Maybe you get some people buying back in because of the absence of Arthur Smith, but I still have to envision that he's going to be some kind of a value in comparison to his end of season finish, but maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you. I think his ADP is definitely going to going to drop a little bit going into next season. And and yeah, there is potentially going to be some value there as he, he again, the talent is all there for him. Um, we'll see who comes in at quarterback as well. That might that might play a part in it uh, as well. But hopefully uh, we, we get an upgrade at the quarterback position for him as well. So, um, all right, we'll keep it rolling here. I do want to give a quick shout out, though, to our, our presenting sponsor, Fabric by Gerber Life. If you have a family, then you need to get term life insurance to protect them. It's one of the smartest financial decisions you can make, and the start of the new year is the perfect time to get it done. So you could focus on whatever else the year has in store for you. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget with quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes, and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash fantasy. That's meetfabric.com slash fantasy. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash fantasy. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company. Not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. All right, let's go to our next surprise tight end one that uh, th this is the this is the last one that we have as a shared um, option here. Who is your... Uh, surprise tight end out of Dallas, Kate. Got to talk about Jake Ferguson, who coming into this season was one of my absolute favorite tight end options was, a, I thought, a, a really intriguing sleeper option. Obviously, the tight end position has been a staple of the Dallas Cowboys offense. You look at the efficiency that Jake Ferguson showed as a rookie and all of his metrics kind of pointed to this potential for a, a true breakout season, especially with the fact that Dalton Schultz was going to be leaving this Dallas Cowboys offense. And uh, like, man, for the fact that, you know, they, they drafted a tight end fairly early. I think there were people kind of wondering, like, what are you going to get out of Jake Ferguson in particular? And guess what? You got exactly the season that you probably were hoping for in a, a tight end that could take a possible opportunity and turn it into something very tangible here in year two. Kind of crazy that he's only in year two, but 854 receiving yards, eight touchdowns in his second season. Saw a little bit of a drop off in terms of his overall efficiency in terms of yards after the catch per reception, yards per route run, passer rating when targeted, like all of those, those metrics took a, a slight drop in terms of efficiency, but Overall, man, you look at his involvement, especially in the red zone and the end zone, all of that paved the way for a big time season. I, I, I just absolutely love Jake Ferguson and his connection with Dak Prescott. He was tied for the third most red zone targets in the league among tight ends, second most end zone targets. Like all of that paved the way for an incredible year too. And I, I don't see any of that changing anytime soon with the the situation currently, you know, remaining what it is in Dallas. 
Yeah, like you said, this was definitely a surprise. You know, he made a few sleeper lists for us. So we talked about him a little bit in the offseason, right? But he was still, he was getting drafted as tight end 26, uh, according to the Fantasy Pros ADP, and finished as tight end 9 in PPR. Um, and like you said, strong underlying metrics in, in his 2022 rookie season, but didn't really get the playing time. So it was a pretty small sample size. It was hard to figure out how much we should rely on that. And then, even with Dalton Schultz departing in free agency, like you said, there were still some concerns about how much Ferguson would play considering the Cowboys' other options at the position. And while those concerns did kind of linger at least through the first month of the season, his snap counts, they weren't like ideal in any way. He was still efficient and we saw that talent eventually allow him to kind of break through and work as the Cowboys clear cut full-time tight end and average around 80% of Dallas's offensive snaps from week six on, um, which I, th I think just provides a little bit of comfort for fantasy managers, right? We were, we were playing him every once in a while, but he was, you know, in that 60 to 65% of snaps range. So was, there was always some risk to it but once we saw those snaps kind of solidify as as in more of that safe range we definitely felt more comfortable there um and then yeah delivered nine top 12 finishes in his 16 appearances this season good for a top 10 ppr uh finish among tight ends on the year which you love to see especially for a guy that went undrafted in most fantasy drafts this past offseason um now like you said could be a potential mainstay at the position heading into 2024 thanks to this big breakout season so yeah excited about uh, jake ferguson going forward Forward. Um, let's talk about a tight end that might have let us down uh, in in his uh, in this season. Um, I'll start with well, we talked about Arthur Smith's uh, former tight end Kyle Pitts. We're going to talk about Arthur Smith's uh, new tight end that he'll have. It's Pat Fryermuth of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was drafted as tight end ten, um, but finished as tight end thirty uh, on the year. And he definitely he missed some time due to injury, but still appeared in eleven games this season and managed just three top twenty tight end finishes in PPR. Uh, one of those games, which was Week Twelve, he was the overall tight end one for the week. But outside of that, Fryermuth didn't really give fantasy managers anything to be excited about finishing as tight end 29 in points per game. Um, and again, for a player that was drafted in that top 10 for his position, it was built off kind of solid production that he had delivered in his first two seasons. He had finished as the overall tight end 14 as a rookie improved upon that with tight end six finish in year two, but just fell well short of both of those marks in 2023. So it was a career low, obviously in points per game for him finishing outside of the top 20, Five uh, in target rate as well, sixteen point four percent yards per route run, one point one twelve, one point one two, um, and yards per reception. All those outside of the top twenty five, and then only found the end zone twice during the fantasy season. So, not a great year for Pat Fryermuth. We will see if things can get better. I don't know. It's a, always a concern with now with Arthur Smith being there, but definitely year three uh, was a drop off from what we had seen in the previous two seasons for him when he was trending in a positive direction for fantasy purposes. Yeah. Obviously you also have, you know, a lot of issues with, with health. Pat Farmuth was dealing with that hamstring injury, but when he was on the field, obviously there was a big problem here in the Pittsburgh Steelers offense that they were avoiding the middle of the field, like the plague, which Unfortunately for Pat Fryermuth, that is where he runs the bulk of his routes is over the middle of the field. So when you have a quarterback that is uh, avoiding the middle of the field, not going to bode well for your target rate. He was targeted on just 15.9% of his routes run. And that ranked 30th among tight ends with at least 25 targets. That was the same target rate as Darnold Parham Jr. of the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, it, how about uh, Kylan Granson targeted on a higher percentage of routes run? Foster Moreau, that is the likes of, of players that were targeted on a, a higher percent of their routes run and were more involved when they were actually on the field. But I do hope, so obviously there are a lot of questions, you know, and I think people are probably going to be terrified to draft Pat Fryermuth again, <laughs> knowing that Arthur Smith is coming in. But I'm going to look at this as maybe a positive because obviously there's been a, a big problem at the quarterback position for the Pittsburgh Steelers. We know what he's very good at. Arthur Smith is going to be running the football. We know that that's what the Steelers, I think, kind of want to do. And I think that they want to set up a passing game that is, you know, built on play action that is centered around the run. And I think that 
Arthur Smith's probably one of the best fits to do that in a very weird, bizarre universe. I'm not as upset about it as maybe I should be. But if they can open up this passing game by establishing a firm and successful run game, if they build out this offensive line, if Kenny Pickett can deliver the ball to the middle of the field and start setting up some of these plays, maybe we see Pat Fryermuth bounce back a little bit because I do believe firmly that despite the down year, I, you know, I still think he's one of the best receiving tight ends in the national football league. And he's got the hands. I think he's got the skills. It's just a matter of getting the targets and setting up plays after the catch. And that's not something that Matt Canada's offense was very good at doing. Hopefully Arthur Smith can do something, something a little better because <laughs> We cannot waste this man's talent any longer. I'm with you. I, there, there's at least hope to have there. And like you said, for all for all of those reasons, and we'll see. We'll see what happens at the quarterback position with Pittsburgh um, and, and Kenny Pickett there and company. But um, yeah, they're, they're, you're right. There's hope and it's going to be hard to get worse for Pat Fryermuth after this past season. So there's he should at least be able to bounce back. Who else did you have as a disappointing tight end um, from this past season? Disappointing tight end. Ooh, I've got to talk about Darren Waller, who I was so excited about heading into oh, this I season. Know. I really thought that the Giants pulled one over on the NFL here and went out and, you know, in a, a terrible wide receiver free agency market, got their tight end, you know, via trade. And, and that tight end was going to be their wide receiver one. But Unfortunately, Darren Waller, like none of the stars aligned for him this year, started off the bat like, you know, not not a great opener to the season. But then week two finished as a top five tight end, uh, tight end four on the week in full PPR formats. Then you kind of bought in right week three. You come back tight end 25 week four tight end 26 like. There were more downs than ups this year for Darren Waller. And obviously, like the issues for Darren Waller, they go from health to the system of the offense, the inefficiencies that they had at quarterback. Then, you know, Tommy DeVita, like there was a whole slew of mess that I think helped contribute to Darren Waller's str struggles. He finishes the overall tight end 22 on the year. Uh, which I still think is somehow still incredibly high for what <laughs> what like what we actually got out of him. But, uh, you know, just super disappointing because there was a real opportunity to carve his his role out as the top dog receiver in this team. And it just never came to fruition. I don't know. I don't know if it ever will again. Like I he's aging he, the health has been an ongoing problem it hasn't just been this season like are we ever going to see prime darren waller ever again it doesn't feel like it right like the one of the reasons that we liked him so much coming into the year was just betting on you know the injuries not being a concern right he seemed like he was going to be fully healthy and like you said there weren't a lot of clear number one targets on the Giants offense. And it just seemed like Waller was going to be the perfect fit to kind of stand out and lead that team in targets. And yeah, it just, neither of those things really happened, right? He, he, even when he was healthy there, there wasn't the, 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 I guess the production that we were hoping for. And then yeah, injuries once again became an issue for him. So you know, try not to put the injury prone label on players too much, but it's been so constant now for Darren Waller that it's hard to kind of ignore it at this point. So yeah, I, I have a hard time imagining that we're going to see prime Darren Waller again. That was seemed like a nice fit here with the giants, considering the, the other receiving options that they had, but just didn't come to fruition, unfortunately. So yeah, I'm with you. Darren Waller, definitely a disappointment this year, even if injuries did play some part in that. And uh, interestingly enough too, like obviously the, the hamstring issue, he's had these hamstring issues. He came out to say at some point in the season, like apparently it's more of a nerve issue than a true, like a hamstring muscle injury. So I don't know, I, I'm not going to pretend to even speak on, you know, the, the nerve issue whatsoever, but 
nerve issues a lot more scary for me, uh, especially considering that, you know, this guy is what, 30, 31 years old. That's a big red flag uh, that it's not just a a tight hamstring. It's not just a, a nagging injury that, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's definitely not good for his long-term prospects to, to see him bounce back, which is such a shame because, you know, when we last saw him producing, you know, with the, the Raiders that he was one of the best receiving tight ends in the league. And it just, ugh, yeah, I, I just, I feel like there was a ghost of the 2023 season that we're never going to see with Darren Waller, but I want to, I want to be on the other side, like the, the alternate universe where Darren Waller was fully healthy this year. And I, I wish we could have seen that play out because he's just such a fun and dynamic player to watch football when he's play football, when he's fully healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. And there was definitely a path there. Unfortunately, it did not go that way. So um, maybe we we get it. next year. It's just feeling, yeah, it's just feeling so unlikely at this point. It's just, again, like you said, as these players, Waller specifically kind of gets older and dealing with injury issues, uh, we never start to really, our bodies feel better as we get into our thirties, as somebody who's speaking from experience uh, and in constant pain for God knows what reason. Um, but yeah, this is because uh, we're waking uh, up because we're, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm not even taking hits every day, but man, I'm 32 years old. So just one, one year older than Darren Waller. And I'm, I'm a little slow to get out of bed in the morning. So yeah, if I've got a pinched nerve, I've got a pinched hamstring, something. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that that would have me playing my best football, but you know, RAP to what could have been in 2023 for this very talented, but unfortunately aging and unhealthy tight end. Unfortunate for sure. Um, yeah, let's t- t- get a shout out from our uh, friends at DraftKings as well. Uh, the leader in fantasy sports. They just dropped a brand new fantasy app called Pick 6. Pick 6 is the newest way for you to get in on the fantasy football action with DraftKings. Just pick two and six NFL players, pick between two and six NFL players and choose if they're going to have more or less of a stat. For example, will a player have more or less than 100 rushing yards or will a player have more than one touchdown? Um, You can track your lineup and compete against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. Download the DraftKings Pick 6 app now and sign up with code PFF. That's code PFF only on DraftKings Pick 6. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 18 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. Valid only in states where DraftKings Pick 6 operates. Pick 6 not available in all states, including but not limited to Connecticut and New York. For up-to-date lists of states, please visit dkng.co slash pick six states. Uh, void were prohibited. See terms at pick six.draftkings.com. All right, Kate, let's talk uh, another pleasant surprise on the season. Who did you have as your second uh, pl- or third pleasant surprise of the year at the tight end position? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kate's not feeling well and she's coughing. So why don't I start uh, and give Kate a little bit of a break here? Um, I'll start with my pick and it is Trey McBride of the Arizona Cardinals. Sorry. Uh, No, it's okay. Um, (laughs) Trey McBride was drafted as tight end 35 on the year and he finished as the tight end eight on the year. And in 2022, it was interesting. I, you know, McBride had this kind of opportunity to emerge when Zach Ertz, Zach Ertz missed the final seven weeks of the year, but he managed just one top 12 finish in that span and just the 19th most tight end fantasy points from weeks 11 to 17 when Ertz was out of the lineup in 2022. Uh, And then we got Ertz returning to the lineup to start the year for the Arizona Cardinals. It appeared that McBride would kind of continue on a typically slow tight end development path, but That changed once Ertz suffered an injury in week seven and then didn't play another game for Arizona for the rest of the season. Um, McBride essentially went on a tear from week eight on delivering four top five PPR finishes over his final nine games and ultimately accumulating the second most tight end fantasy points over that nine game span. Um, 
really kind of established himself as the top receiving option on the team, earned an elite 27% target rate, which was tied for first among tight ends from weeks eight to 17. And he was efficient with those opportunities, despite coming up with only two receiving touchdowns, which is pretty crazy. Um, he's still tied for the most receptions at the position and the third most receiving yards uh, over that span. He had 63 receptions, 621 receiving yards. So really impressive kind of, back half of the year for Trey McBride in a, in a similar situation and how it played out in his rookie year, but was just way more efficient, like took a huge leap in his production. Um, so that was, I think, really promising to see. And then obviously now Zach Ertz is not on the team anymore. So year three, Trey McBride um, should co hopefully continue in a similar path here. So McBride definitely makes the list for me. Yeah. McBride, I, I feel like kind of came out of left field. He had a, a very, you know, non-existent rookie year we'll say yeah. um so kind of just came out of the woodwork and you know you mentioned that that high target rate that led all tight ends on those routes run uh in that second half of the season he led all tight ends on the entire season despite getting off to a pretty slow start here in this arizona cardinals offense um was targeted on uh just under 26 percent of routes run that led the pack of all tight ends by a mile um, very, very impressive, you know, top end efficiency ranked second in yards per route run. Um, you love to see, especially the volume. Now, my only question from Trey McBride, you know, we're going to be moving forward. Obviously I think he benefited tremendously from the lack of receiving options there in the Cardinals offense. I do think we're probably going to be looking at a very, different looking offense like the, the there's a real chance that they're going to walk away with one of these top receivers in the draft I think uh you know depending on who that is do we see Trey McBride relegated to more of a, a backup role obviously like he was the top receiving option you didn't have a healthy Marquise Brown you didn't have Zach Ertz can he still maintain that target share when there are other when there's competition for targets and that that's going to be my biggest question for Trey McBride, especially as we see this offense start to shift and rebuild really their entire receiving core. So I, I, I'm excited about Trey McBride, but I still have that lingering question in my mind, which is probably why I'm going to miss out on Trey McBride. And I'm sure I'm going to be kicking myself in the booty at the second half of next season if I don't have him on my fantasy roster. So it, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy for Trey McBride. Very surprised, but are you still bought in for next year? That's my question. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. And obviously still a lot of off season to go. We'll see what they do in the draft. But like you said, it, it feels like wide receivers possible. Marquise Brown, a, a free agent as well. Right. So um, there, there's going to be a hole to fill there. And yeah, I, you know, I think for, for next year, I still feel okay about him as things kind of stand right now. Right. There, there's going to be a rookie wide receiver coming in who should be really good, but we don't know exactly how they'll acclimate to the NFL. Right. Whereas Kyler Murray and Trey McBride now have this kind of connection where we've seen him target him heavily and I'm sure that target rate's going to come down it's a, it's an incredibly uh, high mark here which is bound to regress right so I, I'm sure we'll be tempering expectations some but I still feel fine about Trey McBride so it'll be interesting just to kind of see where he's going in drafts and who's going around him before you know trying to figure out if we if, if I if I like him enough to still kind of draft him heavily this season but uh, yeah I wasn't drafting him heavily this offseason but maybe this season we will we'll see what happens um, all right. Who else made your list as a surprise, pleasant surprise tight end here, um, from the 2023 season? I've got to give my, my flowers to Cole Komet tight end for the Chicago bears who wasn't drafted overly high. He was drafted on average as the tight end 13 in full PPR formats. Didn't finish like overly far ahead of that tight end eight on the season in full PPR formats. But, I mean, his season was absolutely remarkable. Posted career highs uh, in, in catch rate, 83% uh, catch rate, 719 receiving yards, six touchdowns. Um, posted career highs, uh, 1.7 yards per route run. Uh, passer rating when targeted. Like, he played really good football this year. And 
we saw a really high ceiling, which is something that I wasn't sure if we could expect that from Cole Komet. Had two games with two receiving touchdowns. Uh, and, you know, obviously there were a lot of ups and downs for Cole Komet. Had a couple of, but had several um, very disappointing games where, it, you know, three games with 10 or fewer receiving yards. But I'm very impressed with the ceiling. And I have to imagine, obviously, like there are questions about what are the Bears going to do at quarterback, but Cole Komet, a, a I think a very stable and reliable high upside option here in the passing game that I just didn't, I didn't expect him to have the ceiling that he did. Uh, and I, I think that that's a very good sign of things to come, whether they stick with Justin Fields and we get a full season of healthy Justin Fields. I think that'll bode well for Cole Komet, but I think regardless, he's probably carved himself out a role as a, a stable asset in this receiving core. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe him, right? He, he was very stable um, th this season, which it's hard to do at the tight end position, but 10 top 12 PPR finishes on the year is, is a really nice and kind of comfortable number to be, you know, plugging into your lineup every week. And yeah, sure, there were some down games in there, but he also had some nice um, bigger games as well, which he rewarded you for sticking with him for, with, for right? Like the two tight, the two touchdown games, like you said, um, were, were obviously huge. So Nice stuff from Cole Komet and, and yeah, just steady, stable option kind of going forward feels like uh, the right spot for him and obviously sign that extension this offseason as well. So he's going to be around and yeah, just a matter of what we'll see at quarterback for Chicago will be very interesting uh, as well. So let's go to our final disappointments of the 2023 season the players that let us down uh who is the last player that let you down uh at the tight end position uh in 2023 Ugh, we've got to talk about dallas goddard who I, i've always loved dallas goddard i love his game and you know again like so many of these guys that we talked about today <laughs> health was a factor for dallas goddard um but finishes the the tight end 14 in full ppr formats was, I, I think, just kind of a victim of this offense that we saw, you know, Shane Steichen left, and I don't think they ever fully recovered from that. Obviously, you had health issues with Jalen Hurts as well. There, He's competing with two of the, the top receivers in the NFL between Devonta Smith, between A.J. Brown. It is hard to compete for a, a consistent target share, and I think when we saw all three of these guys on the field at the same time, we saw that there's not always room if the the Eagles are not going to be as productive or as efficient as they had last season, there might not be a consistent role for all three of these guys to be posting fantasy points in the same outing. And Dallas Goddard was was definitely, I think, the victim of that for me. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I love Dallas Goddard. I, he was one of my favorite targets in drafts this offseason. And just I, again, I love the offense. It, it was just we knew that it was going to be a crowded offense as well, where targets were going to be, you know, spread out between him and A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and potentially some of the running backs as well. And Jalen Hurts was going to steal touchdowns. But man, it, it really um, put a hamper a damper on his his season here because yeah just the three top five finishes missed time with injury as well um but there then, was just some really down weeks right like yeah go go ahead yeah the, the efficiency i you know i think again maybe health played a part in that both mm -hmm. his health the health of jalen hurts but like you saw a, a dip in you know his yards after the catch per reception a career low 1.3 yards per route run career low 9.7 yards per reception like he was never a big you know touchdown guy he's never had more than five in a season but I think we were able to rely on a lot of that that efficiency as a receiver that he could rack up the yardage and it, we saw without consistent yardage uh, because he's not overly involved in in the red zone because he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns that the floor was a lot lower than it had been in previous seasons. We've been so spoiled by Dallas Goddard. And I think, you know, this does seem to be with all of these career lows, career low uh, PFF receiving grade 67.7. Like 
it seems like all of this should put him in the cards for some sort of bounce back in terms of efficiency next year because this is such a big outlier, but it hurts. It, it really hurts. <laughs> Yeah, it, it hurt. And, and yeah, I was hoping like we would see maybe some positive regression, at least as far as touchdowns go, because he was such a, a good tight end after the catch. And he often came so close to to getting in the end zone and, and came up short. And uh, yeah, just didn't happen, unfortunately. So I don't know. Another one of those players that I, I still believe in the talent, um, but we'll see what that offense kind of how they operate in, in 2024. But I, I don't expect a ton of major changes there. So um, he still could be a, a name that is w drafted within those top 12 tight ends. But that now we just have more tempered expectations for. Um, for sure. And then the last name that uh, is on the list here for me, as far as disappointing tight ends go, not somebody that was drafted overly high, but somebody that we considered a sleeper, I think, a, a lot this offseason, at least Nate and I did, was Chigozim Okonkwo of the Tennessee Titans, drafted as tight end 16, but finished as tight end 2023. 20, it, it was more just the the hope for upside, I think, that we never really saw come to fruition for, for Okonkwo. He was very similar to Jake Ferguson to me. He boasted like a lot of those strong underlying numbers in 2022, including 2.61 yards per route run, which led the position for players that ran at least 20% of routes. And he had the second best tight end receiving grade, 84.6 as a rookie, right? So we kind of figured that there'd be this possible ascension up the depth chart because Austin Hooper left. Um, and, and there was at least some optimism that he could deliver a breakout season. Um, his role did increase from 2022 to 2023. Uh, he nearly doubled his 172 routes run from last year, uh, going to 383 this year. It just it wasn't enough to provide any sort of consistent fantasy production throughout the year. Uh, we saw his snap share also kind of fluctuate wildly throughout the year. And, and while he did at least finish as the PPR tight end 10 during the fantasy playoffs, it was one of those things where it was just too little too late as he had kind of solidified his spot on fantasy benches by that point. Right. So we saw like the drop fantasy off waiver wires. Like it was, yeah. it was that bad. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, it, you know, there was maybe deeper leagues where you were plugging him in and he play, paid off in the playoffs. But for the most part, this year was a disappointment. We saw everything kind of regress in, in a big way um, for him in 2023, despite moving from the 50th most route runs at the position to the 17th most route runs at the position. Um, we saw his target rate drop off significantly. We saw his receiving grade drop off significantly. And obviously those yards per route run as well. All of those finishing uh, 20th or lower at the position so yeah we'll see Okonkwo still young still in his career I I, I like the player still I, this is kind of a, a underlying theme here for these disappointing tight ends they're players that I still kind of believe in at least to the for the most part and hoping that things get better but now you know there's they've burned us here so we do have to kind of temper expectations a little bit at least I that's the way I feel so I don't get hurt again but uh yeah still hoping for the best for Okonkwo yeah uh protect your heart um always protect your heart first yeah. and you know what like i think this is a valuable lesson for all fantasy managers if there's a player that like i was never fully in on chigakonkwo so like if things fold out the right way this off season and i see an opportunity i know that there are plenty of people that don't want to get burned again um yeah. it, like Sometimes it's it's worth taking a look back at some of these players that had these disappointing seasons and like a Kyle Pitts, you know, like a Chigakonkwo, see who people might not want to get burned by again because people have to protect their hearts. But if your heart was never hurt in the first place, some of these guys might be worth a look as these post-hype sleepers, uh, you know, and... I don't know. Sometimes you can find some real diamonds in the rough moving forward when we're looking back on these disappointing seasons. Yes, I love that. That's a great point. Um, yeah, so we'll see how the ADP shakes out as we get closer to the 2024 season. But yeah, some good stuff to keep in mind there. So I, I enjoyed this exercise, Kate. We went through all the positions. Uh, we did running backs, we did quarterbacks, we did wide receivers, and wrapped it up today with the tight ends, our biggest and biggest surprises and, and biggest disappointments of the year. So it was fun. Um, I, I, I always enjoy these kind of retrospective looks at the season, what we got right, what we got wrong, um, and then just kind of find, putting a, a little twist on it here. So hopefully uh, people enjoyed that as well, and we'll keep the off-season content rolling as well. But 
we do have our playoff picks to finish off here. I know it's still two weeks away. Uh, the Super Bowl is set, though. It's the 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Kate, I am seven and five with my picks. You are eight and four. You cannot lose, but we can mm -hmm. tie. Um, so for that reason, I'm letting you pick first who you think is taking the Super Bowl, and then I will be taking the opposite and trying to come up with uh, a <laughs> rationale as to why. <laughs> I'm still going to roll with the San Francisco 49ers, which I'm going to be honest, I don't feel good about. I do not feel good about this at all. But I do think pound for pound, they're the better football team. Yeah. Right now, they're not looking like it. So this might come back to bite me in the booty because right now the Chiefs offense is looking fluid. The Chiefs defense continues to look excellent. Like it has all season long. And right now it's... But it, it feels like the these two teams have like pulled a freaky Friday through the playoffs. And now we're seeing the the 49ers come to life. But I do think obviously this has been uh, you know, a, a postseason where we've seen Kyle Shanahan make some great second half adjustments. And I'm gonna say they take the bye week and they're gonna make a quote unquote second half adjustment ahead of these, you know, Super Bowl weeks, these Super Bowl practices. I do believe that just as they found the answers in game that they are going to with one of the brightest coaching minds in the game right now, come up with some sort of answer for the Kansas city chiefs. And I'm going to be honest, I, I want the kid, the King Brock Purdy to walk away with a <laughs> super bowl ring. Like Christian McCaffrey deserves the super bowl ring. George Kittle deserves the super bowl ring. Like I want to see, this team that I truly wholeheartedly believe is the better team pound for pound to walk away with the ring. Yeah, this uh, this hurts because I was hoping you would pick the Chiefs yeah. and, and then I could have the 49ers for all the no, reasons you, that you just mentioned. Just last week, you said you cannot root against Patrick Mahomes. So that's I, right. That's right. I just set you up <laughs> for the answer you knew in your heart you had to give all along. Yeah, yeah. So I picked the Chiefs last week. It worked out. I'm okay with sticking with the Chiefs here. We got the biggest advantage as much as, like you said, the the pound for pound, the 49ers are the better team. The position where it matters the most, the Kansas City Chiefs have the best player at the position at Patrick Mahomes. And Oh, we quarterback just saw... this, quarterback that. <laughs> oh, my God. But, but they also got the magic of Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, the love story that is continuing into the Super Bowl. It's got to end with a happy ending, right? So we got to go with the Kansas City Chiefs because the NFL script writers aren't wrong and they're, they're, they're <laughs> going to go with it. So yeah, this is uh, this is going to be a good game, man. I, 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 I picked the 49ers heading into the playoffs. I, I thought they were going to be the Super Bowl champions. I still I still do think that, but I am picking the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm going to stick with it. Um, I I. I could see it going either way. So I don't feel bad about picking the chiefs here and yeah, Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, Travis Kelsey and company get it done again and win back to back Super Bowls third of Patrick Mahomes' career. So on the path to, to pushing for Tom Brady, just like so many people thought he could, but it's still going to be pretty tough. This is a, a great matchup. I 49ers team is awesome. Yeah. Give me the chiefs. Let's see if we could at least end up in a tie. If not, Kate gets the crown and uh, you know, does not have to share it. I'm going to be honest. So the fact that you're playing for the tie kind of makes me feel like I've already won. It, I, oh, you yeah, you've definitely won. Yeah, no, this is. <laughs> <laughs> I I am getting nothing out of this. Uh, it's it's been yeah. You you got all the picks right uh, heading into the Super Bowl, and there's nothing I could do to win. So. If by that logic, you've basically already won. So I'm just kind of hoping um, to for a tie here, and uh, yeah, but just the just loser mentality from me uh, as <laughs> as I hope for <laughs> as I hope for just the non worst case scenario. Um, but yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. We'll we'll see how it turns out. We got a couple of weeks, obviously, until the Super Bowl, but. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for tuning in. We'll we'll do this uh, next week. We'll have an episode where we're done, obviously, with the biggest disappointments and 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 surprises at the position. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a look at this year's upcoming free agency class and talk about our favorite landing spots and possibilities for some of the top fantasy options that are going to be available and expected to hit the open market. So that'll be a fun exercise as well as we kind of, you know, again, it's fantasy football, so we're playing fantasy free 
free agency, right? What uh, mm-hmm. what else can we do at this point in the off season? So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Kate, thank you as always for coming on here and uh, pumping out another episode with me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and before you go, please remind everybody where they can find more of you and your work. Yeah, absolutely. Give me a follow on Twitter at Kate Majuk, M-A-G-D-Z-I-U-K. Uh, I'll be, you know, obviously here on the podcast uh, doing some Steelers content at Behind the Steel Curtain, uh, hopefully squeezing in some off-season articles here over at PFF. So, uh, yeah, give me a follow and I'll I'll post my, my work all off-season long and I can't wait to play fantasy free agency. This is going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a fun exercise. Uh, I, I, It'll just be, again, for pure fun. And then once those free agency landing spots um, actually happen, then we'll talk about that a little bit more. But we're, we're going to play some more fantasy here in uh, mm-hmm. February, I guess it'll be. So yeah, everybody uh, go check out Kate's work. Um, you can find my work on pff.com as well, writing all kinds of off-season content as well, not just fantasy related as well. Um, but yeah, we'll see you next week. Enjoy the Pro Bowl, I guess. Um, and until next time, peace out.